Welcome everyone uh, to Petrara Medical's latest webinar series. My name is Brian Bechtel, Director of Clinical Engineering and Clinical Marketing, and I will be today's host. This is part of a clinical innovation series. Petrara, Petrara Medical is for a predictive health company based in Silicon Valley. We have a focus on medical devices, sensors, predictive health, uh, and today's topic is going to cover that of intra-abdominal pressure and abdominal compartment syndrome. So without further ado, I will introduce Greg Shears uh, to introduce uh, who's gonna be our moderator today. Uh, and Dr. Shears will then introduce Barbara McLean. Dr. Shears. Um, thank you, Brian. So uh, I'm a, a, a pediatric intensivist and anesthesiologist from the Mayo Clinic, and I have the honor of uh, being able to introduce our uh, speaker today. Um, uh, Barbara McLean has been in critical care practice for 40 years. Currently, Barbara is the advancing evidence-based practice clinical specialist for the division of critical care at Grady Health System. And for those of you that don't know, Grady's in Atlanta and is uh, one of the largest public health systems in the country. She is a member of many professional organizations, including the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and the American Association of Surgery and Trauma, and has been awarded the Excellence in Education by AACN, as well as the Circle of Excellence for Clinical Practice in 2014, and the SCCM has presented her with the prestigious Norma J. Shoemaker Award for Critical Care Nursing Excellence in 2013. Uh, in 2017, she was the first nurse ever to receive the Joseph A. Brown Award from the Society of Critical Care Medicine for her contributions to qu critical care practice. In 2018, she was recognized as the most valuable player for the Grady Initiative in combating severe sepsis. Currently, Barbara has been intimately involved in the care of critical care COVID-19 patients during this ongoing epidemic. She has guided teams in practice, assisted with development of strategies to limit exposure to staff, and has facilitated family visitation at end of life in the COVID uh, patient population. As an educator, provider, and practitioner, Barbara is committed to patient care and safety, critical care practice, collegial communication, and evidence-based practice Im implementation at bedside. Most importantly, every day of her personal and practice life are spent working towards improving care for patients and families. And on a personal note, I would like to say that I've um, uh, watched Barbara speak several times and I'm always very impressed. She has a unique, um, very sophisticated um, understanding of physiology and is an excellent educator. So you guys are really in for quite a treat today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara and let her um, take over. The host muted me, he must know me very well. He was like <laughs> worried I would talk out of turn. So thank you very much for your patience. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Shears, my really wonderful colleague, and also thank you, Potrero Medical, uh, to uh, facilitate this ability for me to speak to our colleagues about something so incredibly and critically important. Uh, most of you who know me uh, or who know of me, uh, I am a self-proclaimed hemodynamicist, and my whole uh, scientific perspective in clinical practice is really about the uh, the understanding and the pursuit of understanding for compliance, blood flow, pressures, and volume. And what a wonderful thing, because that's allowed me to really fully uh, integrate myself in the understanding of mechanical ventilation, uh, pulmonary arterial catheterization, and of course, for today, intra-abdominal pressure. I'm so excited uh, to be able to share what I do and what I understand with you, and hopefully we'll be able to investigate this together as well. So I'm going to share my screen now, and that will bring up my slides. Now just take one moment while I bring that up, and thank you for your patience. So one of the most important things that we can say in today's world is that pressure monitoring uh, has become part and parcel of our everyday practice in critical care, yet we still uh, struggle 
with the understanding of what really is about volume, what's really about compliance, what's meaningful, what's not, and most importantly, the understanding of when is fluid uh, resuscitation valuable? When is it too much? When is it not enough? So of course, I may not be able to answer all of those questions today, but what I am going to be able to answer is why is intra-abdominal pressure monitoring so critically important? And finally, easy for us to actually measure at the bedside. So I always think it's important for us to appreciate uh, that our, both our, our moderator and myself, we are independent persons. We both are consultants. Uh, Dr. Shears is a consultant for Portero, and I am a consultant for Baxter and Prismac CRT. I'm also a consultant for Edwards Life Sciences. But I want to be sure you know that what I offer to you today is based on the evidence, based on my opinion, based on the work that I do, and may not really reflect the opinions of Portero. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Shears, as he mentioned before, is a practicing intensivist and anesthesiologist and uh, is very interested in research and highly, uh, highly involved with ECMO and hemodynamics, which is one of the things that has drawn us together as colleagues. And he told you about myself as well. Again, the most important thing for you to know about me is that I'm at the bedside. I don't do 12-hour shifts, but I consult at the bedside. I work with nurses and physicians and other providers at the bedside. Uh, and I don't ever ask any person, nurse, physician, APP, or housekeeper to do anything I wouldn't do myself. And so I'm frequently doing things in order to uh, share with others the simplicity, how we use it, and how we implement that into our practice. So for today, I wanted to share with you from Current Opinion Critical Care in 2020 that there are some very important points for us to appreciate when we're looking at critical patients. Recent evidence and historic data both tell us that early predictive intra-abdominal pressure elevation is a key clinical sign to the uh, the initiation of your patient into the spiral of death. It is a very common process that occurs with critically ill patients and most particularly occurring with critically ill patients in relationship to fluid resuscitation and cytokine storms. So one of the uh, points of this study in terms of looking at evaluation and correlating this study to other recently published data in 2017, 18, and 19, which we'll look at in a moment, close to 50% of critical patients actually suffer from intra-abdominal hypertension. The majority of those are patients who are actually intubated on ventilation. And I think as we move forward and we see, uh, as we're gathering data and, and we're relaying the evidence as we care for COVID-19 patients, we'll see that it will be a significantly higher level of patients who are critically ill with intubation mechanical ventilation in COVID-19 who actually are suffering from intra-abdominal hypertension. Now, the issue of intra-abdominal hypertension, which I think is so critical for us to appreciate, is that this is a canary. It's a canary that is singing to us that we have fluid extravasation and compression of hollow organs and then of solid organs. That's really the key piece to intra-abdominal hypertension, is appreciating that the fluid extravasation contained inside the abdominal vault is compressing the hollow organs like the bladder and the stomach, and then actually compresses fluid-filled organs and solid organs as that pressure increases. So one of the most important aspects is to appreciate that mortality is going to rise precipitously in patients who have intra-abdominal hypertension. By the time you open their abdomen, the damage is already done. So one of our goals, our goals worldwide, the World Society's goal, and the World Society is now changing their title, all hemodynamicists and all persons who appreciate and understand intra-abdominal hypertension, the monitoring and prevention of ACS, our number one goal is to work hard to help others actually recognize this very insipid, very villainous process that is occurring inside the abdomen. And I don't know about all of you, but I'm so focused on the heart, the lung, the brain, and the kidney that I'm not actually 
always thinking about the abdominal vault. Now we know that we can do a bedside point of care ultrasound and we can have someone who is an ultrasonographer and who is certified in ultrasonography be able to take a look in, a, uh, in evaluation of whether or not there's presence of fluid in the intra-abdominal vault. But actually, all this should always be in the hands of the person who's at the bedside the most. And that would be the bedside nurse. The bedside nurse should have power, opportunity, knowledge, and equipment to actually evaluate the presence of intra-abdominal hypertension. And then the ability to co coordinate that communication with the providers who can actually make a change. And our number one goal would be to avoid a decompressive laparotomy. We always want to avoid that. So I want to remind you that two of the major culprits, not trauma, although yes, of course, trauma causes intraabdominal hypertension because you have free blood, uh, perhaps pancreatitis, perhaps uh, acute liver dysfunction. But for all of us in critical care, what our focus should be first and last and in between is on aggressive fluid resuscitation and cytokine, cytokine storming. Those are two of the major culprits that actually put our patient into the spiral of intra-abdominal hypertension. So we, again, want to just reiterate that historically it's been a little bit difficult. We've had to have a lot of specialized equipment. We have to open up the Foley system and many uh, issues with our methodology and doing it correctly that actually interfered with our ability to measure that. A really beautiful uh, prospective multi-center study from uh, one of my colleagues, Edward Kimball, someone that I know quite well, and others. He's not the primary author, but he is my colleague, uh, that was published in Critical Care Medicine in 2019, actually looked at uh, uh, 491 patients worldwide, across the world, um, and looked at the components and their indicators, their risk indicators for the development of intra-abdominal hypertension. So you can see across the top, it says all patients, those who don't ever have intra-abdominal hypertension, those who have it, those who have it during ICU admission, and those who have it after day one. And you can see out of 491 patients, only less, just about half actually, a little bit more, maybe 51% of patients do not have intra-abdominal hypertension, but the others do. And the others actually uh, proliferate their intra-abdominal hypertension to different stages. And there are four stages of intra-abdominal hypertension. But one of the things, and you can look across the, the p-value and see that there are significant indicators in the p-value that correlate to Patients' central venous pressure, no surprise, central venous pressure would go up if you have intra-abdominal hypertension. Uh, looking at lactate levels, looking at SOFA scoring, but of course, one of the things we focus on here today is both mechanical ventilation and fluid balance in the ICU. So I'm going to correlate that to another really lovely article. It's a little older, from 2012, which was uh, titled, Should We Measure Intra-Abdominal Pressure? in every intensive care patient. So they didn't necessarily say yes or no, but Barbara says yes. So uh, in this paper, the discussion is that we should be suspecting intra-abdominal hypertension in all ICU patients, particularly those who are mechanically ventilated. And they also discuss the paucity of guidelines that tell us that we must actually evaluate intra-abdominal pressure. So, the understanding, the theory, the didactic, the physiology and the pathophysiology is totally open for all to view. We don't have a particular guideline that's been embraced by all providers across, uh, particularly across the United States, in terms of evaluation of intra-abdominal pressure. And part of that is uh, a lack of simplicity, equipment, and a lack of staff knowledge in how to actually measure this appropriately. And it's also related to a lack of responsiveness by providers when nurses actually report intra-abdominal hypertension. So I think that really brings us beautifully to appreciate the preponderance of information that we've seen over the last two and a half years that 
discuss the importance of fluid balance in critical illness. Now, after uh, 2004 uh, and the Barcelona dictum of the early goal-directed therapy and severe sepsis, we all jumped on board and it was beautiful. We jumped on board aggressive fluid resuscitation. That was a really important component for what we were evaluating and gave us a method to uh, attempt to prevent the spiral of sepsis to septic shock. And we were using aggressive fluid, 20 to 30 mLs per kg. Some people were doing 40 mLs per kg. And all in search of an, a dynamic endpoint for fluid resuscitation, which was gorgeous. But of course, what always happens uh, is that we can go overboard. And really what we saw and what we see now in the literature is that a, aggressive volume resuscitation has a detrimental effect on both the lungs and the kidney. And by the way, the kidney is embedded in the abdominal vault. And so it obviously, and actually, of course, profoundly affects the free presence of volume in the abdominal vault. Now, when we think about this relationship, as first and foremost is that we know that we may be increasing profoundly the hydrostatic pressure of the vessels, but in addition to that, we're looking at glycocalyx injury, endothelial injury, and the inability to maintain fluid in the space it was designed for. So we have this very profound alveolar capillary leak. We have the, uh, all, all of our vasculature, which is leaky, and the capillaries, which are leaky, and the gastric capillaries, which are leaky, um, and peritubular injury. Uh, both related to microthrombi, uh, correlated to COVID-19 or severe sepsis, but also to the leaky capillaries. So I always refer to this as compartment syndrome. When we have extravascular fluid in the lung, we're going to call that pulmonary compartment syndrome. When we have extravascular fluid in the abdomen, we're going to see renal compartment syndrome. We're going to see gastric compartment syndrome. We're going to see intestinal compartment syndrome related to that free fluid, which is compressing the vessels, the hollow organs, and then the solid organs. So one of our perspectives is that our goal in fluid resuscitation is to try to find the best possible dynamic endpoint. Some of us use uh, passive leg rays, others use stroke volume monitoring. We're using different methodologies. We're all looking for that holy grail. But in the meantime, we actually have to consider where is the fluid that we've given our patient going, and the most common place will be in the abdomen. So this is a beautiful visual as uh, uh, Manu Malbrain, who is one of the leaders of uh, understanding in hemodynamics and abdominal compartment uh, syndrome and increased abdominal pressure, uses a very similar visual in almost every single one of his publications. And in particular, I love this because I always talk about when you go to the bedside and your patient looks like the Michelin man, we always have concern that the fluid we see is the smallest part of the problem. We're seeing that you have fluid that has created that interstitial volume overload and the patient is leaking fluid now from the skin. But we certainly know that that fluid also is present as extravascular lung water and as extravascular lung water is compressing and filling the alveoli. And now we're going to try to recruit your alveoli with positive pressure airway strategies, mean airway pressure strategies, like higher PEEPs or pressure control inverse or APRV or even oscillation. Uh, if we're lucky, we're probably going to move quickly to ECMO. But what about if we could actually consider, is there a way to prevent that extravasation as best as possible? Then we think also about cardiovascular. So always uh, our, our focus on the heart is, is there enough inotropic property and tension development that the myocardium and filling of the, of the chamber, that the myocardium can actually enact an appropriate stroke volume? We don't always think about the fact that we might actually have edema, that we may have a pericardial effusion that is not something that we're thinking about as a, an acute cardiac tamponade, but because of myocardial edema, myofibril edema, myocardial edema, pericardial effusion, all compressing the heart, limiting the size of the chamber to be filled, and therefore the amount of volume ejected from the heart.
Of course, we understand as it relates to the kidney that now we also have interstitial edema in the kidney and the venous pressure actually goes up and up and up. And remember, it's the veins that are leaving the kidney that actually profoundly limits glomerular filtration and tubular regulation, putting us into acute kidney injury. And although there are many other things, hepatic, gastrointestinal, visceral, others, I want to just remind you about the abdominal wall. That the abdominal wall is profoundly at risk for tissue edema. And as edema forms in that lots of interstitial space in the abdominal vault, remember, compression will occur for hollow organs, for vessels, and for solid organs. So everything that is shared inside the abdomen will be affected by that presence of fluid in the intra-abdominal vault. Now that, of course, reminds us just about the general physiology and pathology here, is that when you have an inflammatory response, uh, you actually dilate your systemic vessels. That's a, a direct effect of the endovasculature and a limitation of catecholamine response. And our first step is to resuscitate you with fluid. When we resuscitate you with fluid, that inflammatory response has also caused changes in the glycocalyx and your uh, capillaries are profoundly leaky. So now I have volume leaking into the interstitium, but I'm still relatively hypotensive, so I may get a second bolus of fluid here. And once that second bolus of fluid on top of the first one, along with the integral alteration of the capillaries, leads us to profound tissue edema. And again, that edema starts to form in the abdominal vault before you see it anywhere else. And eventually, that fluid in the abdomen is actually going to overcome the compliance of the abdominal wall. Now, the abdomen is pretty darn compliant, but the beauty here is that I've got two hollow organs that I could actually look, look at the pressure within them to help me understand whether or not that external fluid is compressing the organ, making an organ that once was very compliant, the bladder, into a non-compliant organ because the fluid surrounding it is compressing it, all I have to do is measure the pressure in the bladder. That's going to tell me about the compression of the bladder because as most of us are aware, when you have a largely compliant chamber, you can add a lot of fluid into it before you ever see an increase in pressure because fluid in a compliant chamber doesn't really create pressure. But once the chamber becomes non-compliant and fluid goes inside it, the pressure that we can measure will go higher, higher, higher. Now, I want to correlate that very clearly with central venous pressure, which again, central venous pressure is not a volume indicator. We look at central venous pressure as an indicator of loss of right-sided right -sided heart compliance when we're giving volume. So it's not a volume indicator, it's a compliance indicator. And intra-abdominal pressure measured in the bladder is a measurement of loss of compliance from an incredibly compliant organ, the bladder. So I think we, we, we have a lot of understanding here we have a lot of understanding about pulmonary compartment syndrome. And in COVID, we've divided really into two states, but these are two states that we can take forward anywhere we go. We talk about the hypoxemic vascularly dysfunctional acute respiratory failure. That's the low elastins, high compliance lung. That's the lung that responds to high flow, CPAP, BiPAP, non-rebreather. And that patient in our care practice today, and I would say, I think probably for the future, whether we're in COVID or not, that we're going to use tummy time, self-proning, mobilization, good pulmonary hygiene, controlling pressures. But as that patient progresses into a more, uh, a more traditional form of what we consider ARDS, which is high elastance and very low compliance, requiring mean airway pressure strategies to recruit the alveoli. We've given some fluid. There, is, there are vascular changes, as we saw here, that are now also here, along with de-recruited alveoli, so a double, a double dose of dysfunction in those patients, and a rapidly progressing microvascular pathology. So those individuals are, are the individuals that we know from the recent analyses and the historical analyses. Those patients who are intubated, who've received volume, who have 
uh, traditional or more non-traditional ARDS, uh, traditional ARDS or CARDS, that they have microvascular changes, they have extravasation of fluid into the extravascular lung compartment. That fluid is also uh, compressing and filling the alveoli, limiting our ability to open the lung and promote gas exchange. We also know that with acute kidney injury, both hyper and hypovolemia profoundly impact care. And one of the things I think is really important for us to remember here and in ARDS as well, is that we are now entering to a phase of more limited fluid resuscitation because of our awareness of how aggressively fluid resuscitation affects the lung and the kidney. And it's always really difficult to say, well, this was the cause and that was the effect. But we do appreciate and understand that when we have intra-abdominal uh, extravasation of fluid, we'll have compression of the kidney, compression of the renal arteries, compression of the renal veins, and therefore causing stasis of blood in the kidney, which will then profoundly impact renal integrity. We know that we really want to gain and manage patients with individual endpoints for fluid resuscitation. And CRRT, from my point of view, is something we should always consider early on when we have refractory metabolic acidosis. CRRT is also a very effective form of intervention for patients who have uh, uh, free fluid in the interstitium of the abdominal vault. Remember that what we do in CRT is we remove volume from your vein. And first, we're just going to clean that volume and put it back in. But over time, we're going to concentrate that volume, and that's going to allow for interstitial fluid flux into the venous circulation. And ultimately, as we decompress all of our organs, lo and behold, happy days are here again. You got a blood pressure, you have better cardiac function, you have better lung function and yet better renal function. So those are really important ideas and strategies for us to appreciate when we talk about intra-abdominal hypertension. I've quoted two articles here, one from 2014, one from 2013, but there are hundreds, literally hundreds of articles talking about intra-abdominal pressure and renal function, fluid resuscitation and renal function, and the role of acute kidney injury in the progress of mortality in critically ill patients. And so last but not least, and I basically uh, am saying to you that there's a high risk of acute abdominal hypertension with hypervolemia. So again, we're gonna limit fluid resuscitation, but we have two major commitments as bedside providers to patients who are under our care. When we have resuscitated with fluid, we owe them first and foremost, accurately and continuously collect their urine output and accuracy of urine output actually depends on a constant uh, method of draining urine and prevention of airlocks that limit the ability of urine to exit the bladder and enter the Foley bag. We also owe it to all of our critical patients that we would like to monitor intra-abdominal pressure at baseline. And then as we are resuscitating with fluid, with vasopressors, even with inotrope, we should be monitoring intra-abdominal pressure. That should be constant and it should be as frequent as necessary. It should be continuous if at all possible. And we're gonna use those endpoints to also help guide us with fluid resuscitation. And it will then also allow us to have, again, an early intervention for refractory metabolic acidosis. So I'm gonna beg your forgiveness because I did not actually pull too many scans from my individual patient population. I wasn't able to pull that many. I do have some that are from my patients. But just as a reminder, we're looking here at a beautiful cross-section of the abdomen, and the abdomen is relatively fully occupied with a lot of little space in here, fully occupied with solid and hollow organs. And there's a lot of space in here for the extravasation of fluid. Now, intra-abdominal pressure is the pressure that is inside the abdominal cavity. So yes, I could put a trocar cath in there and measure your pressure. We know that the pressure changes based on your respiratory movement. So with positive pressure ventilation, of course, the diaphragm is going to be pushed down into the abdomen, that makes the chamber smaller, that makes the pressure go up because it's less compliant. And then during exhalation, uh, obviously the diaphragm lifts back up. Now that's with positive pressure ventilation. It's exactly the opposite with spontaneous. But I want to talk about the ICU patients, so in particular related to mechanical ventilation. Now, 
I want to remind you that the pressure inside the abdomen is affected by the volume of the internal organs, by any intra-abdominal volume, and by other conditions that might limit the expansion of the abdominal wall. An abdominal binder, uh, a, uh, a, a, a closure device that's too tight after you've had abdominal surgery, pregnancy, uh, COPD, many things that limit the expansion of our abdominal wall. But the one I really want to focus on here is the presence of intra-abdominal volume. Now, I want to remind you that I'm not, I could stick a trocar cath in, but why would I want to do that? It's so invasive. I already have a Foley catheter. So what I want to do here is measure the reflection of the fluid in the abdomen, the compression on the bladder, which I know to be beautifully distendable. And that means that normally my bladder, even as a nurse with two liters in my bladder, normally my bladder pressure is less than five centimeters water pressure. But, when fluid accumulates outside the bladder and compresses the bladder, that bladder went from being a size 14 dress to being a size two dress. So whenever I put any little volume into that bladder, I'm gonna see a reflection as a high pressure. It's a non-distendable organ in the presence of free fluid in the intra-abdominal uh, surface. Oh my gosh. How amazing is that? And I already have the idea to put a Foley in those critical patients. So if we just remind ourselves from the World, uh, the world Society of uh, Abdominal Compartment Syndrome that intrinsic pressure within the abdominal cavity is what defines intra-abdominal pressure. All the organs, the fluid, and the amentum. The intra-abdominal hypertension is pressure greater than 12 without obvious organ failure. So that's really stage one. And as the pressure goes up, you enter into different stages of intra-abdominal hypertension until you have at least one, one overt new organ dysfunction or acute on chronic organ dysfunction. Now that's where the issue really resides because an overt new organ dysfunction might be a non-recruitable lung. Could be a, a ventricular chambers that cannot fill with volume because they are no longer distendable. And that's where the problems come in because it makes it really hard for us to say, it's absolutely this. It's absolutely heart failure, rather than saying, is it possible this is heart failure mediated by intra-abdominal hypertension? So, what is compartment syndrome? I love this slide. I think I probably stole that from Tim Wolf years ago. This is a picture of people pushed into a subway car, pushed up against the wall, too much volume for that compartment. The other thing I would just say is just reminding ourselves that if we have a size 14 dress and a size 14 body, it fits really nicely. If I have a size two dress and I try to put a size 14 body inside that size two dress, I'm gonna elicit a lot of pressure. And that's really what happens with compartment syndrome. Now, we don't have a whole lot of struggle understanding limb compartment syndrome. Looking at acute or chronic limb compartment, we'll stick a needle, we measure the pressure, we open the fascia, we release the pressure. We don't have a lot of problems understanding cerebral compartment syndrome. You have increased intracranial pressure, you compress your fluid filled chambers, your ventricles, we open your ventricles, we drain fluid, and then we take part of your bone off. It's not a big deal. We do it all the time. We totally understand it. We also really understand lung compartment syndrome. If I'm having to increase airway pressures, uh, recruitment pressures, that would be PEEP, again, pressure control in first, et cetera, et cetera, to open your lung, you've got lung compartment syndrome. So I'm not certain why we're struggling so much to really appreciate abdominal compartment syndrome and make that part of our armamentarium when we're looking at managing our patients. So we take a look at a normal head CT and we see that the ventricles are open and that the edges are clear and there isn't fluid accumulation. And then we look at an abnormal CT with a bleed, sorry, with a bleed and we see a shift of the dura and the compression of the ventricles. 
don't have any problem seeing that this is really dangerous and deadly and we've got to do something about it right now. With normal lungs and here with a very rapidly space occupying pneumothorax. Don't have any problem recognizing this, being worried about it, sticking a needle in here or a chest tube in here to treat it. However, when we look at the normal abdomen and we look at fluid in the abdomen, and then I'm going to give you a very gross picture just because I think it's so meaningful. Uh, this is a, a pediatric visualization with acute abdominal hypertension, and you can see how everything shifted up, and you have this very profound vascular uh, alterations that have occurred. This is abdominal compartment syndrome. So I want to remind you about the trio of suspects. Patients that have refractory hypoxemia, patients with refractory ICP, patients with refractory lactic acidosis. Those are frequently patients that may end up going for a decompressive laparotomy, and we might have a struggle putting their intraabdominal contents back into their abdomen. Now, this is just a compliance issue, right? Because normally inside the abdomen, your pressure normally is zero to five, up to 10, up to 15, okay. But as more and more fluid accumulates in the abdominal vault, I'm going to start putting pressure upon my organs. So you can see here, I can put a lot of fluid in to the abdominal vault when it's very distendable, but the more volume that I add, uh, the less volume will correlate to a much higher pressure. So here's our pressure, our intra-abdominal pressure. And when we get up here, you can see that with that pressure also is the compression of the organs and the incidence of organ dysfunction. So that's a very straightforward visual for us to say, I can put a lot of fluid in a distendable vault, but as my uh, vault becomes more full and more full and more flu full of volume, it becomes less and less distendable until you reach a point that the pressure starts to go up because the chamber is no longer distendable. And remember, I'm going to measure that really either in the bladder or in the gastric bed, measure that pressure as it relates to the fluid extravasation and the compression of the uh, hollow organs. Now that starts to make the diaphragm shift and the lung gets compressed, the heart gets compressed, and the, not the diaphragm shift, but just the volume in the abdomen compresses our kidney. So this is pretty darn worrisome when we're talking about our patients. Now, many folks say, well, I'm looking at them. They don't have abdominal distension, so my patients don't have intraabdominal hypertension. But we know that about uh, less than 40%, so that means more than 60% of the time, abdominal distension isn't present. The only way for us to overcome this is by accurate and timely measurement. And that's the only single measure that really helps us to evaluate impact on the microcirculation. So the points are IH and ACS are common entities, IH, intraabdominal hypertension, ACS, abdominal compartment syndrome in the critical care environment, including yours. IH and ACS increases profoundly mortality and morbidity and length of stay, but signs, external clinical signs are unreliable until it's almost too late. So we have to monitor early. We have to trend. We have to make it as simple as possible. We cannot burden our bedside nurses any more than they are burdened currently. We cannot burden them anymore, but we need to give them tools that are simple, accurate, don't require, whoops, I'm measuring during inspiration. Whoops, it's expiration. Whoops, it's inspiration. Whoops, it's expiration. Nope because of the diaphragm and the diaphragm shift. We've got to give our nurses tools that help them to evaluate our patients uh, appropriately. Now this is, oh, sorry about that. It's probably because I'm using my cursor. So this is also, again, back to the study from Kimball and others, just taking a look at the percentage of mortality in patients as they develop intraabdominal hypertension and that intraabdominal hypertension on the day of admission and then develop after day one. So very, very important to look at that increase in mortality as we move to uh, higher grades of intraabdominal hypertension, more pressure and compartment syndrome, that the mortality is really significant with stage 
uh, grade three. Grade four, the mortality drops just a bit because grade four almost always gets a decompressive laparotomy. But really, we should be looking here, and actually, we might help to look here. So we want to actually do a prophylactic preventative method of monitoring for intra-abdominal hypertension. So this is our old fashioned way. You might be doing it a little differently and that's all cool. This is just a basic way. Then you say to your nurse as the provider, we need to monitor intra-abdominal hypertension. The nurse has to gather a transducer, at least two stopcocks, a 60 ml syringe, tubing with saline back spike, lure connector, tubing with lure on both ends, a needle or an angiocat, the clamp for the Foley, and assemble that all in a sterile fashion. And so this is basically at my bedside, pressure tubing, 60 cc, a clamp, a needle, a bag, a chlorhexidine, setting it up, getting it ready, connecting it to the patient, pushing fluid into the patient. This is our patient, so you, I'm so sorry that his gown is dirty. Uh, but you can see he does have a distended abdomen. That partially is his normal state. He's, he was morbidly obese. But this is the visualization for intra-abdominal pressure. Now, it's labeled here as LA pressure. Sometimes we label it CVP. Most of our monitors don't have a label for intra-abdominal pressure. And once we've injected, we wait about 20 seconds and we're looking at the respiratory variation. And we have to really find the average of the intra-abdominal pressure on that patient when looking at the monitor. So now I just wanna do a quick case. 51-year-old woman presents to ER with three days of epigastric abdominal pain. She's nauseous, she's vomiting, has coffee ground emesis. She's an alcoholic, eight to 12 drinks a day, history of alcoholic hepatitis, et cetera. And here are her vital signs. So heart rate's 115, blood pressure 105 over 50, respiratory 28. Measure now, this is time zero. So you might have asked, and you know, it's the ER and they're very busy there and they don't do a lot of pressure monitoring. So no one's quite sure how to do it. So you might have asked for it, but it may, maybe didn't happen. Now on physical exam, we see that she's got some concerning exams, um, but most importantly, we're looking at her labs. Obviously we think she's infected, her platelets have dropped, her sodium is a little low, potassium seems normal, her creatinine acceptable, we don't have a baseline creatinine, and her bicarb is okay, so we're not so worried about her right now. But she ends up uh, just progressing a little with some abnormal vital signs. We decide to admit her at the ICU. She has assumed severe pancreatitis, and once she has the CT, we make a confirmation. She's NPO, OG2 plays, broad spectrums. She gets 40 mLs per kilogram lactate ringers or plasmolite. Now, do we want to measure her now? This is now time one. So you're now in the ICU and you ask the ICU nurse, oh, I don't know where the equipment is and I'm not sure about it. And I got two other patients. I really don't have time. My patients are really sick. I'm just trying to keep people alive. Haven't had lunch, haven't had a break. And one of my patients has COVID, so I'm dawning and doffing. I'm not saying this in a negative way. This is our reality. Now that patient's respiratory status deteriorates and the nurse is at the bedside taking care of the patient. They just haven't measured the intra-abdominal pressure. Now look at your patient. Your patient is now in severe metabolic and respiratory acidosis with a profound significant base deficit. Should we measure now? This is now time two. But the nurse says, oh, I'm brand new. I'm just off orientation. I've never measured it before. Don't really know how. I'm happy to do it. Can you help me? Can you advise me? How do I get my equipment? What should I do? I'm already using all my pressure modules and what pressure modules should I be using to measure this pressure? This is not uncommon. It's complex to measure intra-abdominal pressure with handmade pressure transducers. Now the patient has increasing abdominal distension, declining level of consciousness, poor airway protective reflexes, so she gets intubated on the vent, very bad blood gas. We do a very nice job of managing her 100% FiO2, F is 16, 400 tidal volume, and A to PEEP on AC mode. Her peak pressure is 28. And remember, that's the amount of pressure that's generated when the gas flows into the lung. And the PEEP plat, when we shut the exhalation valves, looking at the gas distribution across the lung is 20. Both of these are very normal. She looks okay. And her blood gas got better, but she is hypoxic. Her blood gas got better from her CO2 perspective. She still has metabolic acidosis and hypoxia. So we do the right thing and we gradually increase her PEEP. And as we increase her PEEP, what actually happens is we make her worse, right? Her oxygen gets better, her acidosis gets worse. Her acidosis is significantly worse. 
And her urine output was 35 mLs per hour, but we don't know how much she weighs and we don't know for how many hours. Now, should we measure now time three? Oh my God, I'm too busy. Like she's about to code. I'll do it as soon as I can, but I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to keep the patient alive, doctor. I'm really I'm t titrating up on her catecholamine. She's acidotic, she's refractory. I'm going up on that. I'm running around and it's just not that important to me, that intra-abdominal pressure. Okay, well, 24 hours later, take a look at your patient. So now she's really refractory. She has re profound uh, attempts of respiratory compensation for her significant and profound metabolic acidosis. CVP is 20. She's on pressures, uh, pressures with a central line. That happened earlier. And now what we do is take a look at her chest x-ray and we can see that her volumes are really, really low. And her abdomen now is markedly distended and tense. Her skin is cool and what we can see here is her creatinine went from 1.2 to 2.3, and she is profoundly acidotic with lactic acidosis. So we failed our patient, I would say. This is my patient, so I'm, I, I'm not saying I was the person at the bedside, but this is a patient in my hospital. We failed that patient. Now look at her. Negative 12, 7.22, PaCO2, because we're trying to blow off her CO2 is 28. She's still hypoxic, and her PP and plat are very high. She's on six mLs per kg of tidal volume. So we reduce her tidal volume because her lung, which once was a normal lung, is now a baby lung, down to four mLs per kg and a rate to 35. Her vasopressors have been titrated up to the guardrails on the pumps. And she's just getting worse. She's just getting worse. She's more and more and more acidotic. Her peak pressure and plateau pressure continue to rise. We've dropped her to four mLs per kg because she has a tiny little lung. So we've adjusted the volume to meet that tiny little lung. And she's been in Europe for four hours. We're gonna measure now, time four. Oh my God, this looks really bad. This patient's not gonna survive. Okay, so when we take a look at this, time zero to time one, IEP 14, time one, 21. She's already got intra-abdominal hypertension. Time two, she already has one new overt organ in dysfunction. Time three and time four, she has four organs in dysfunction. And by the way, Carol King and James Taylor said it right. It is too late, baby. It is too late. You now want to monitor her intra-abdominal hypertension because she's got abdominal distension and she's almost dead. It's too late. The time would have been now. And that's the idea of trying to look at the best methodology. So I'm gonna use this very quickly and just say, here are the things we need to be aware of in our critical patients. So this is, uh, I've, I've adapted this from uh, Regley, Pelosi, and Malbrain. Again, Manny Malbrain, and uh, probably everyone knows Paolo Pelosi, uh, that, that these are the things we're thinking about when we're looking at a patient that we believe has intra-abdominal hypertension. So we can see, this is pretty straightforward. Your lungs are not functional. You have metabolic acidosis, you have metabolic acidosis and refractory catecholamines. The change in level of consciousness and if we're monitoring ICP, it's up. Your filling pressures are up, your ejection volumes are down. That's my timer to say, time to be done. And she has no blood flow to the kidney. She has obstruction to renal outflow. So she has pre-renal failure and obstructive renal failure and she's refractory to diuretics and meets stage two to three rifle criteria. But here's the thing, her bladder is compressed. And if I were to measure the pressure inside her bladder, I would actually see that she has profound intra-abdominal hypertension. So I'm gonna tell you that uh, I, I may have a slide a little later, but here's the thing I'm gonna say. Sedation, analgesia, paralytic, restriction of fluid, and number one, number one, number one, I want to put my patient on CRRT to remove venal volume over time, first to just clear her from metabolic waste and metabolic acid, to actually allow her to become more responsive to her catecholamines, and ultimately to remove fluid so that I'm mobilizing fluid from the interstitium. That's what I wanna do. I wanna treat her medically. I don't wanna give her another injury by opening her abdomen. And I want to do it soon. And I want to do it with finesse. And I want to do it in intelligently. So those essential components, consistency is essential. Nurses have to do it in the same way. We have to have a baseline. We've got to have a closed system. We cannot wait for abdominal compartment syndrome to be present before we decide to check IAP. 
and we want to monitor our high-risk patients and intervene before it's too late. So in this really lovely article from Kelsen and others, they said they looked at a, a, a basically a monkey survey, uh, or survey monkey, a monkey survey, right? 22 out of 109 uh, nurses said, we didn't monitor because we don't have the equipment. Five out of 109 say, we don't monitor because no one does anything. Four said it costs more money. And frequently, frequency of monitoring, 48 out of 109 said, only if we think it's significant, the patient's already got a distended abdomen. 26 out of 109 said we should measure every four to eight hours. Eight out of 109 said every 12 hours. Well, I'm here to tell you, you should be treating this like arterial pressure. This is something you have to monitor continuously. So what if we can obliterate the issues of equipment and what if we can make this simple and relatively continuous? So that's really the idea of utilizing Protero's uh, Foley catheter in this very intelligent, the Accurant device with the intelligent Foley catheter that provides high resolution, accurate urine output, has an active drainage line clearance. So what, what it actually is, is a circulation that pushes the urine into the urine collection. It's a digital collection and the bladder is emptied conti empty continuously. That way I can really look at your renal function, your volume status, and make some assumptions about your renal perfusion. But it also allows me to do real-time intra-abdominal pressure measures at the push of a button. No additional equipment, no disconnection, no problem. Measure from the balloon sensor near the tip of the Foley catheter, which allows continuous IAP. Now, I will say that in order, oh, sorry. In order for me to monitor this, I need to have a specialized catheter that has the sensor, but I can also always collect the urine accurately, continuously, uh, with any Foley catheter attached to an accurate device. I do have to have a specialized Foley catheter. That's a one-time catheter change where I put the specialized catheter in, and that will allow me both high-resolution accurate urine collection and the continuous IAP data. Now, this is a, a small movie that is meant to show us uh, basically the active line clearance, but we discovered that the movie wasn't running on Zoom. But what you're seeing here is so you have a, a line that's actually using an air circulator that actually enters into this and pushes the urine down into the digital uh, urinometer and it's measured digitally every single minute. And so I can look at every minute urine output, every hour urine output, your six hour, your eight hour, your 24 hour. I can look at it in relationship to your weight. So I can look at mLs per kilogram per hour, which is gonna give me so much more and profound advantage. And at the simple touch of a button, I can measure your intra-abdominal pressure. This is something that we have at my hospital. Uh, we have three of these. This is uh, called the AccuTab. And it's a tablet that we mount on an IV pole outside the room so that we can look consistently and constantly at your total urine output since the reset. So that could be from the beginning. The hourly urine output in this current hour, the prior hour and the hour before that, the patient's temperature, and of course, their abdominal pressure. This is mounted for us outside the room on an IV pole. So I want to remind you, intraabdominal hypertension leads to multi-compartment compression. It's a multi-organ tamponade. Decreasing functional lung surface area, making P peak and P plaque go up, and you are not able to oxygenate your patient. Cardiac compression, which then presents as pulmonary edema, aortic compression, hypotension, increased CVP and PAD if you're using a PA catheter, but most importantly, refractory hypotension. And profound venous compression, which by all accounts can be evaluated by your increasing CVP. Then you give your patient a liter of volume trying to resuscitate this, CVP goes up, but all these get worse. Nothing gets better. It's too late. And it's all from the abdominal hypertension. So I love, I love this book. I, I actually was at Mass General when that book was written. When I read this book, it's really from Beth Israel, the house of God. Beth Israel in uh, Boston was written by a resident from Beth Israel who said, if you don't take a temperature, you won't find a fever. Well, that's right, until it's really significant. If you don't count respirations, he didn't say that, I am. You don't count respirations, you might not suspect respiratory compensation until it's really significant. And if you don't measure abdominal pressure, you're not gonna suspect IH until it's, a, until it's abdominal compartment syndrome. So I think it's really important for us to appreciate that in the words of my great colleague, Dr. Greg Shears, when you can't get your hands around why things are going wrong, 
your patient's volume non-responsive, urine output is down, functional lung surface is down, peak is up, plateau is up, heart is compressed, patient's got pulmonary edema, all those things we talked about before. You need to get your hands around this before the singing canary actually is dead. The singing canary is intra-abdominal pressure. I wanna thank you for your diligence and staying with me. I see that you're all still there and I'm so grateful that you've stayed with me. Uh, this is my email. You're welcome to reach out to me anytime for anything that I can assist with. And now I'm going to turn it back over to our host. To stop sharing, or maybe I'll keep the share, but uh, open up for questions and answers. And thank you for all the hard work you do every day at the bedside. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, very much for that excellent presentation. Um, it's such a complex uh, topic, and you help to really try to simplify it and also give us um, so much of the, the recent information uh, to uh, uh, help us put it all together. It's, um, to me, it has always been so frustrating. I, I know that IAP exists on a continuum, but people don't want to pay attention to it until it reaches that extreme. And as you very aptly pointed out, the, um, the ability on physical exam, for example, to detect um, intra-abdominal pressure is very poor. One can't um, really assess it unless until it's too late. So um, given the tremendous advantage that um, uh, the Acuron device could bring to clinical practice, both in its uh, uh, increased accuracy of urine output and the ease with which one can get real-time intra-abdominal pressure monitoring, how do you think that could help transform critical care? Well, I hope, I hope that was evident in, in what I talked about, which is that if I'm able to do a baseline measure, and then as I go forward and I'm fluid resuscitating, vasopressor resuscitating, uh, I can actually see the extravasation of fluid and therefore the compression of the bladder, as highlighted by the pressure monitoring that I'm doing of the bladder. If, if I was a person who loved cardiac dysfunction, which I do, and if I was still using PA catheters, I've used about 4,000. If I had a patient where I was giving some fluid to them and their uh, left ventricular and diastolic pressure that we call the, the reflection of that we call wedge, and the wedge pressure was going up, 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 I'd be on the phone immediately. I'd be, I'd be holding on, I'd be calling my colleagues and the providers to come and look at the patient. We'd be doing diagnostics, we'd do evaluation because we'd want to stop that dead in its tracks. So I think what the point is to say that I normally will have an intra-abdominal pressure and really, let's say it this way, an intra-bladder pressure, normally negative five to five. So even less than zero because the bladder is so compliant. As I see that process of fluid extravasation and the bladder gets smaller and smaller, that is telling me that I am giving my patient therapy that is making them worse, not better. I might feel good in the moment because maybe the blood pressure went up and then it came back down and I'm feeling like I've done something good. But the reality is that that fluid extravasation, remember, in the places that we're not looking right? So we might not be looking at your ICP because you're not a head injured patient. You didn't have a stroke, but you've got intracranial extravascular fluid. If you've got it in the abdomen, you've got it there as well. You have it in the myocardium. We're compressing your arteries. We're compressing your kidney. We're compressing your bowel. Those of us who work at the bedside know that when you have, when you have a mesenteric infarct, when you have a, 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 an infarcted bowel, the probability that you're going to survive is very low, and the amount of trips to the OR do not equate to survival. You might go to the OR four, five, six, seven, eight times because you've got this infarcted bowel. Why is it that with something simple that may be more expensive than a traditional Foley catheter? I don't know anything about the costs, not my purview, but I would say I always think that a little bit spent up front to prevent length of stay days on the ventilator, length of stay in the ICU, certainly to prevent mortality and morbidity, to prevent loss of kidney function, to prevent loss of, of um, mesenteric function, loss of bowel function, and prevent my patient from going to the OR, because that's the number one thing. I want to prevent them having to go and have a decompressive laparotomy. Is that in and of itself? 
is going to significantly profoundly affect their quality of life. It's also going to be very expensive to care for them over time. So I feel like uh, it, 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 it's strategically, from my point of view, in a, a world where we do aggressive fluid resuscitation for a wide range of diseases of patients who come to the ICU, and where we have a better understanding of the glycocalyx and endothelial dysfunction, I think that not monitoring this pressure to actually give us a guidance of what's actually occurring in unseen spaces, in unseen spaces, I think is, uh, I think it's 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 not as wise as I would like to believe all my colleagues are. I think Thank it's you, really wise to measure this. I, I totally agree with you, and we've we've talked about this before in different uh, venues. Um, uh, I'm going to ask one more question before I bring in Brian Bechtel, who has some questions from the audience. My, my second question is, um, you know, we have to make decisions which patients we're going to uh, deploy technology on, uh, which ones we're going to, um, you know, up the level of monitoring. So as we try to advise people going forward uh, uh, and to realize that we have some big gaps in our knowledge. We have this whole continuum as intra-abdominal pressure is developing and probably having a negative impact. How do we choose which patients we should deploy this technology for? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there really aren't great guidelines that tell us every type of patient that we should monitor. And I think we're gonna make decisions in the best way that we can. But I think that we can clearly see from the work of Kimball and others that uh, mechanically ventilated patients are even more uh, profoundly at risk. So I think we uh, start with our protocols that if you are intubated and ventilated and you are either receiving fluid resuscitation or vasopressors, we need to monitor intra-abdominal pressure. We need to get our feet wet. We need to see the value of it in our clinical practice. We have to get comfortable with it. And we wanna control our expense. But I think first it's sort of like you just, you know, you, you live up in Minnesota. So in the summertime, you have to just dive into that water, right? You've got to dive in here. And, and, and you can't just be meek and put a toe in and try to accommodate yourself to the freezing temperature. It's the same thing here with intra-abdominal pressure monitoring. I think we have to make a commitment. We say it's worthwhile. We use it in the patients that we know are highly identified for developing intra-abdominal uh, hypertension. And then we look at our data and we continue to, to reframe uh, the patients that we see uh, and, and make good decisions about what we're going to do going forward. I agree with you. I, I think we're really um, getting inadequate information on some big groups of patients, cardiac surgery patients, trauma patients, patients with a SERS response, they all are at risk for intra-abdominal hypertension, and we, we don't identify it soon enough. You know, maybe we're getting intermittent lactates. We're seeing some rises. We don't really understand why. And this is, um, this is another way that we can have better insights in terms of what's going on in this abdominal cavity, this sanctuary of uh, information that we can't seem to really fully understand. And I think this will help us do so. So I'm going to turn this over to Brian Bechtel, because I think he's got a couple additional questions. Yes. Thanks, I, Greg. I, I so appreciate it. Before you say anything, Brian, I just, I want to say thank you all for hanging on. I really appreciate that. I know everybody's busy, so thank you. So question, I think, is a good follow-up for what you were just talking about, uh, Barbara, uh, from an anonymous attendee. Obviously, you work in a very busy trauma burn hospital, but you also have a very diverse critical care um, population here. So anonymous attendee uh, asks, outside of burn and trauma, what are the other areas that accurate intra-abdominal pressure should be considered but is currently is not? It's a pain to do this properly and maybe something hospitals should do more frequently. Do you care to comment? Oh, I'd love to comment. Thank you so much. So yes, I work in a center that does trauma and burns. And trauma surgeons, um, trauma surgeons like to look at intra-abdominal pressure, but they generally don't do that until the abdomen is distended because, hey, man, I'm going to measure it now and take you to the OR and open you up. 
Uh, they don't, I, in my practice, our trauma surgeons in general are, uh, and I was being very flipped, so excuse me, our trauma surgeons in general aren't really looking at intra-abdominal pressure quite as early as I would like. Uh, in burns, I think uh, the, the, the attitude about intra-abdominal pressure is, is, is very forward thinking, obviously, because there's so much issue with fluid flux and again, with tissue damage. But I think the reality is that probably one of the most important uh, areas to implement intra-abdominal pressure is in the medical ICU. And those medical patients who, again, if we're thinking about we, we are getting those medical patients who have cardiac dysfunctions, who have volume overload, who have a renal stasis of volume and then extravasation of volume in the abdominal vault. And then I am again going to reiterate that when we're using aggressive fluid resuscitation, so we're using that for sepsis, we're using that for COVID-19, and we're doing aggressive, even trying to find euvolemia, but we're still doing somewhat aggressive fluid resuscitation. Those, I believe, are the patients where we really need to implement this. I think the trauma surgeon and the burn surgeon and the trauma and the burn units in general think about intra-abdominal hypertension a little more or a lot more frequently than medical or medical colleagues do. But I think the best place for us to really make change is in the medical ICU population. And I, the data would, would actually uh, support that as well. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, we've got two, two more questions. It looks like we've got a lot of people still hanging on here. So let's try to get to some of these. So from one of the physicians in the audience, he asked, uh, what about intra-abdominal pressure in patients who are oliguric? And what uh, impact would that have on the catheter or specifically with you know, this, this accurate catheter? Okay, so um, the measurement of intra-abdominal pressure uh, has nothing really to do with the actual collection of urine. So the catheter offers two things, the continuous collection of urine and the ability to instill fluid into the bladder. And if the bladder is, if you're anuric or oliguric because you have compression of the kidney, you have renal dysfunction, you don't, you don't have distension of your bladder with urine, that, that isn't going to affect the meaning of your intra-abdominal pressure. So let me reframe that and say it in another way, because as I was saying, I thought I could say this differently. The idea of your bladder is whether or not there's presence of urine, your bladder is distendable. So whether or not there's urine in your bladder, if there's compression of the bladder, the pressure measured from that hypercompressed bladder is going to go up. Now, if I see that you have three liters of fluid in your bladder, you may have distended your bladder to its limitation and a small amount of fluid in there makes the pressure go up, but it may be because your bladder is so distended, now I need to empty your bladder. Um, but I think the better part of valor is to appreciate that when I have a patient who is anuric or oliguric, and I'm looking for causative factors for their acute kidney injury and their renal failure, I think I understand it because they've been on vasopressors, they're hypoperfused, they have an elevated lactate, they have a base deficit. I'm now saying, let me look at another possible cause, which is intra-abdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome. So the idea again is, whether your bladder has urine or whether it's completely empty of urine, it should never be so compressed that a small amount of instilled volume, 25 mLs, 10 mLs, 15 mLs, a small amount of instilled volume should not then relate to a significant increase in pressure. So I, I love that question because it's, it's a, a, a complex question and it's really beautiful. Uh, but I think in the context of really trying to discover do I have intra-abdominal hypertension? The presence or absence of urine is just another factor that actually could support to me that I have organ dysfunction that may be primarily or secondarily affected by my intra-abdominal hypertension. Thanks, Barbara. You're welcome. And we're, go we're going a little over here, but I got one more question because it's right up your alley working in a busy trauma center. And you and I have talked about this a lot, and there's been quite a bit of evidence published on this around decompressive laparotomies and just their enormous cost and the burden on the hospital um, and just also the recovery time. So Jack asked, 
how many decompressive laparotomies are currently done in the United States annually and what impact would IAP have on that number? IAP monitoring, you mean? Yes. Okay, uh, so I am not going to be able to tell you that, how many decompressive laparotomies are being done in the United States at the current time. I will tell you uh, that uh, I, I, uh, I go to all ICUs at Grady, so I'm not just in trauma surgery, and I'm, my bigger reflection now is really CVICU and medical ICU, but um, what I would tell you that 20 years ago, uh, every other patient in our trauma unit seemed required a decompressive laparotomy because we were so, so, so aggressive with fluid resuscitation. Now that's separate from decompressive laparotomy because of free blood, et cetera. And uh, I, you know, I worked with David Feliciano who wrote the book, The Abdomen. And uh, he really was one of the developers of, of opening the abdomen and, you know, you know basically having a surgical, uh, a quick surgical opportunity to control bleeding and then bring patients back to the ICU and then return them back to the OR. So we had a lot of open abdomens in our day. Uh, you know, that whole triad of, of hypocoagulability and acidosis and hypothermia was something we saw a lot. We had lots and lots and lots of open abdomens. We, we had open abdomens in the day with David Feliciano that we would sew a Bogota bag. You know, we'd open up a, a, a urethral fluid bag uh, and open that up and sew it around the edge of the abdomen. And of course, that was a little inflexible and also gen generated some abdominal compartment syndrome because the abdomen was still swelling, but we had that tight bag across it. We evolved to, of course, a wound vac, et cetera, as, as time moved on, a more flexible opening or, or partially partial closure devices. So I can't tell you how many decompressive laparotomies are being done. I can tell you that they have decreased significantly. And I think that's really, really important. I think that uh, the, uh, it was such a great question that the reason that we have decreased decompressive laparotom laparotomies is because we are uh, a little more sensitive about the effects of aggressive fluid resuscitation. I think many trauma surgeons have taken more of a bent towards maintaining a lower blood pressure, stabilizing the clot, and not trying to achieve normal tension through fluid resuscitation, blood resuscitation. So that's the first point. The second point is how many people really would have qualified for a decompressive laparotomy that never got one because they died before that happened. And I think that's the focus from my point of view is that I can see many patients in medical ICU settings who are intubated on ventilators, refractory metabolic acidosis, titrated up with their catecholamines, profound base steps and requiring CRRT. The question is, how did I get here? And it's easy to explain it and say, oh, he's got sepsis, he's got COVID-19, we try to fluid resuscitate him, and this is what happened, and we accept that goobal gop, you know? We accept that you're volume overload and you look like a Michelin man because we're doing the right thing for sepsis. And I think the point really is that as we're applying those wonderful strategies that have saved lives, we also have to say, where is your fluid going? Because the only good fluid is fluid in the artery. If my patient is hypotensive, I'm giving fluid, I'm titrating up on vasopressors, the fluid that I'm giving is not ending up in the arteries. And a good balance of it is going to end up in the abdomen. And I can't know that if I'm not measuring the intra, uh, and I'm going to say it in a different way, the intrabladder pressure, which indirectly reflects the intra-abdominal pressure. Because I'm not measuring abdominal pressure. I'm measuring bladder pressure. Bladder should be big and really compliant. But when you have extravascular volumes in the abdominal vault, the bladder gets compressed and now it's no longer compliant. So I, I really think that what we don't know is how often we've missed the boat and how many patients actually rapidly deteriorate and indeed even die um, with this component of organ dysfunction that might be something that we could affect uh, in, in the early stages. And again, the effects that we can do medically are sedation, analgesia. We can do paracentesis. We can use paralytics. 
Uh, and we can use uh, very hyperoncotic or hypertonic solutions trying to pull the fluid back into the vein. But then if you've got compartment syndrome, the heart can't handle that volume anyway. So I'm going to tell you, I think, I personally think one of the most important interventions here when I'm recognizing that early is to correlate that with rifle criteria. Have you increased your creatinine by 100% under my care? And do you have an increased intra-abdominal pressure? I'm going to con and refractory metabolic acidosis. You have those big three. I'm going to I'm going to consider and I'm going to work for and advocate CRRT for that patient really early. And I think that actually earlier CRRT in these types of patients will profoundly and end up showing us uh, a significant increase in survival as we mobilize that fluid ultimately from the extravascular space into the vein and remove it because it's veno veno. So. Uh, I probably answered your question more than you wanted. I, I hope I gave you a good answer and something to think about. And again, uh, I know we, we definitely want to be respectful of your time, but also please feel free whenever to reach out to me. I'm always really happy to have a, a dialogue and answer any questions that maybe you didn't have time for or that you have more questions about. Thanks, Barbara. So in the interest of time, Greg, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to touch on before we close down? Um, uh, no, I, I think Barbara, as always, gives a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, with that last question, how many decompressive laparotomies are done? It, uh, uh, my knee-jerk response was not enough. <laughs> uh, because well, That's because we're not identifying the patient. Because we're not identifying it. It's a huge problem. And OK, so. What you guys don't realize that are listening, you know, so, um, and I, I've called Barbara this before, she's like, she's a pinnacle um, predator, a pinnacle clinician who's all over this and her team is really um, engrossed in paying attention to this issue. And that is not the reality out there. People aren't adequately paying attention to this problem. And hence, uh, so many patients are allowed to slip away because uh, they're not recognizing this progression of the develop this insidious progression of intra-abdominal pressure leading to compartment syndrome that just drags a patient down and leads to multi-system organ failure. So as, as one of the, the means by which intra-abdominal organs are put at risk. So um, uh, I think by recognizing it along that continuum earlier and implementing less invasive strategies, um, to a decompressive laparotomy, one, we can decrease the actual need for it and save more patients. So it's a, it's a tricky thing, but I know that we're over time and there's so much to talk about, but thank you, Barbara, for an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Can I just summarize something? You just, you, a lot of brilliant gold comes out of your mouth. So I wanna just summarize what you just said. I would say, as, as Dr. Greg said, Decompressive laparotomies have gone down because in the surgical trauma population, we're being more cautious. So those have gone down in the surgical trauma population. But what he also said, which I think is just so brilliant, and I want to close with that, is that we're not looking for it. And therefore, that's why we're not doing more decompressive laparotomies. But my goal would be not to do more decompressive laparotomies, but to recognize it earlier so that you can avoid it. And that is the real strategy. So I wouldn't be thinking, oh, if I do this, I'm going to reduce decompressive laparotomies. What I, I think the idea is, if I do this, I may significantly impact survival. Exactly. And, I, and I, 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 I loved how you said it, Greg, and I wanted to reiterate it. And uh, again, thank you. Um, Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Potero, for making a, a product that I think is really impactful at the bedside. And thank all of you listening for everything you do every day and for also taking time out of your busy day to expand the ideas that we can use together in practice. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, Greg. Uh, fantastic talk. Um, for those of you listening today, if you'd like any more information about Acuran, you can go to potreromedical.com, Google it. Um, if you need request information, you can just contact us there. Uh, Barbara and Greg, thank you so much for uh, the talk today, but also 
on a personal note, thank you so much for what you're doing and all the clinicians who are logged in. Uh, it's been a difficult year. Uh, you guys are on the front lines uh, and thank you for um, really helping getting us through this and taking care of all the patients who really need you. So with that, we are going to conclude this webinar. For all the attendees, thank you for joining us today uh, and look forward to the next webinar series that we're going to be announcing uh, in a few weeks uh, for the next one that's gonna be coming. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brian. Bye-bye. Thanks, Barb.